So uh, next up, I'd like to introduce um, Lisa Upton. Lisa is a credentialed infection control professional with over 13 years experience in infection prevention and control at the Royal Adelaide Hospital and Central Adelaide Local Health Network. Prior to this, Lisa worked in emergency theatres as an, as an anaesthetic uh, recovery nurse, also at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. Lisa joined the Communicable Disease Control Branch Infection Control Service at the start of August last year as the Infection Control Nurse Advisor. So uh, please make Lisa feel welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Noel. Thank you for having me along. Um, so the purpose of my talk today is to provide an infection control update and give you some tips and tricks um, about how to prepare for influenza season and <clears throat> be prepared from an infection prevention perspective. So off we go. Uh, I'll also talk about um, mode of transmission of organisms, a little bit about infection risks infection prevention control, outbreaks, resources, and then we'll have some questions at the end. So I guess it's really important to point out that microbes are everywhere. We're living in harmony with these micro microbes every single day of our lives. And we, a lot of these are good microbes, but some obviously are bad, and we need to um, have strategies of how we can um, prevent these microbes from causing harm and illness. Um, they're found in foods. Um, humans have them, obviously. Thinking about influenza, our mouth and nose um, is obviously a reservoir and an issue. Um, animals can carry microbes as well, and uh, the environment, water, soil, dust. So if I had more time, I would go into this a little bit more detail, but. Um, that's basically where our germs come from. So these can then uh, transmit uh, and cross, cause cross-transmission in many different ways. Um, the first being airborne. Uh, these are very small uh, particles that when expelled through coughing or sneezing, they can suspend in the air for a certain period of time. Um, or they might be, become airborne through aerosol. Uh, generating procedures or, or coughing causes the aerosol as well. So, um, but they can just hang in the air for a bit and examples of um, organisms would be measles and TB. Droplet transmission, um, these, this is when we have larger um, droplets that when you cough they might travel for about a metre and then they're heavy so they then fall to the ground and might fall on a surface or um, if you're standing within a metre of that person, it could land on your face. And we'll talk about portals of entry in a minute. But um, yeah, so you, to actually pick up a virus or, or an organism this way, you would need that closer contact. Uh, organisms can also travel through contact transmission. So it can be direct or indirect. So um, a direct transmission could be via hands. So if you're shaking hands with someone or touching someone with, with your hands, you can directly transmit organisms to a person that way or indirect contact. So it could be through the pieces of equipment that you're using on your patients. Um, and we also have other means uh, through common vehicle, uh, such as contaminated food, water and blood and um, vector transmission as well. But we will continue on. So I'm sure everyone is aware of the good old chain of infection and if you break any of these links in this chain, you've got a good chance of stopping infection. So the chain always starts with an infectious agent. Um, you then, it, it needs to infect something and uh, there needs to be a reservoir um, and then there needs to be a portable exit, so a way of getting out of the person, for example, um, to uh, then infect another tr person. The mode of transmission can be direct or indirect contact and then, yes, infecting another person and then into a susceptible host, someone who is actually susceptible and may pick up the infection. So um, I guess, oh, sorry, um, 
the main point here is that yeah, any of these links can be broken at any time. And when you look at all the ways of breaking each link, hand hygiene is a very common factor. And that's why we have a real, uh, really keen to promote wash wipe cover, don't infect another for hand hygiene, and especially um, talking about hand hygiene. So risk of influenza infection, um, who are at the greatest risk? Noel will talk a bit more about this uh, in relation to vaccination, but people who are over 65, um, those who suffer chronic conditions, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, from, the, from six months of age, um, children aged less than five years of age and pregnant women are our highest risk groups. What can we do to prevent the spread of influenza? So, um, I'm sure hopefully everyone's aware of standard precautions um, at all times in the workplace. So these are work practices that protect you as the healthcare worker and also protect your, your patients. And we use them regardless of a, of a patient's known um, infectious status. So we actually don't know what, what patients are actually carrying um, or may be infected Affected with, so we always use our standard precautions. So these include things such as hand hygiene, um, which I'll talk a bit more about in a minute, um, a septic technique, uh, use of personal protective equipment. So a lot of people think, oh well, if, if a patient hasn't got the flu, I, I, I don't necessarily need to wear a mask. But if you've got a patient who's presented and they're coughing and their cough etiquette isn't very good and you're concerned, you would definitely consider putting on a mask as part of standard precautions. Equipment cleaning um, and re reprocessing is really important. I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute as well. Uh, environmental cleaning, safe use of um, and disposals of sharps, safe handling of waste and soiled linen. And of course, standard precautions can even mean your uh, tending to your personal hygiene and protection and um, that of patients or residential care um, uh, residents and you know, promoting respiratory and cough etiquette and of course immunisation. This slide is an oldie but a goodie. Um, so it shows a handprint of someone um, uh, putting their hand on an agar plate and it's grown colonies of MRSA. That person has then used alcohol-based hand gel and plated their hand again and nothing has grown. So the gel, alcohol-based hand gel, is a very effective means of performing hand hygiene um, if your hands aren't visibly soiled. Uh, and the, the great thing about the gel is it's portable and you can have it right where you're delivering your care. A um, couple of points to raise about hand hygiene are that, you know, your best defence is having um, a short, non-lacquered, um, plain, natural nails, um, not wearing any jewellery, and uh, especially ones with stones, because basically what that means is you cannot clean your hands properly. And uh, acrylic nails can lead to fungus infections and, and nasties like that. So basically, natural as you can be, bare, um, you're, you, you're going to have more chance of performing effective hand hygiene and protecting yourself and your patients. Just a word about gloves as well. Um, Gloves never negate the need for hand hygiene. So if you are wearing gloves, that's great, but you still need to clean your hands before and after wearing your gloves and between episodes of care on a patient as well. So, um, and it's not appropriate to gel on top of your gloves, but I'm sure you're all over that by now. Um, yes, okay. And there's a really good fact sheet available on the SA Health website about glove use and it's, it's quite simple and it's really good to give to staff who perhaps aren't convinced to not always wear their gloves. Um, okay, so reducing the risk of um, transmission of influenza or outbreak, obviously vaccination is, is extremely important. Um, the other thing it's really good to do is act immediately on any influenza-like illness symptoms, like um, 
don't wait for any pathology. If someone is unwell, act at that point with your infection control or infection prevention practices. Ensure staff have, your, um, have access to the current guidelines and resources that you need for your facility. And have a business continuity plan as well. Um, so if you do end up having to manage an influenza outbreak, you're, you're ready for that. And you might want to refer also on the SA Health website is um, a really great flow chart, which is known as our winter outbreaks, influenza, um, infection prevention and control, preparedness for, for healthcare facilities. So it talks about how to prepare, how to respond, and then how to evaluate afterwards. You know, that, which is really important because you might look at what, what has occurred during the outbreak and then think, oh, what can we do better? Um, prevention is always a good thing, so making sure you've got your respiratory hygiene stations set up at the entrance of your facility with signage to say, please, if you, you know, you're unwell, pop on a mask, clean your hands um, and tell someone, tell someone that you're well on entry. So, uh, and they're really simple to do. Um, uh, Sam, my director, and I, we set this up in five minutes just in, in the office in the city centre building, just as an example. So all you need is a trolley. You don't need anything fancy. A um, bit of blue tack to put your poster up on the wall. And the posters uh, and this fact sheet are also available on the SA Health website. So uh, just a little tip when you're Googling something and you want a, a key document, if you put SA Health at the front when you're starting to Google, that'll bring up generally the document you require without having to know the name of the document, but you'll get pretty close. Um, you can also encourage your patients and residents to be involved in infection protection, uh, prevention, um, and that includes, you know, making sure that they let you know if they're not feeling well, if they present into um, a GP practice or something to um, be aware of those respiratory hygiene stations, that they can put on a mask and clean their hands and let you know that, you know, actually I'm not feeling too well. And we'll talk a bit more about how to manage um, people presenting like that in a minute. Um, but also, you know, so they're aware of cough etiquette, hand hygiene, and again, promoting vaccination um, with the people that you're caring for. And they can also promote good practices with their visitors as well. You can empower uh, patients also to play a part in infection prevention. So reducing the risk of transmission, um, uh, you know, it's always a risk management approach. And that's why it's really good to have your pre-planning to know what resources you have and, and what guidelines you're going to need. Um, but you can always look at things like task review, like can the contact be avoided with the patient, um, such as do you need to um, perform an aerosol generating procedure with this patient? Um, you know, you try and avoid that. So you're avoiding, you're reducing your risk of exposure. Source control, um, you know, maybe with the winter season, encouraging patients to phone ahead if they're unwell uh, with respiratory-like illness. Um, that way the surgery can prepare and um, once the, the uh, patient presents, then again a surgical mask can be popped onto the patient and them encouraged to perform hand hygiene. And then, if, you know, you might, depending on how unwell the patient is, you might um, consider putting them into another room or you'll socially distance them. So you wouldn't sit them right next to someone else in the waiting room. You try and um, encourage them to sit away from other people. Um, when you're caring for patients, to remember droplet precautions are required. Um, this signage is from the National Infection Control Guidelines. So you can print those off. Um, they're available through the Australian Commission um, Safety and Quality and Healthcare website. And also then making sure that you're wearing your personal protective equipment as well as per the droplet precautions. Um, 
So going back to a bit of pre-planning, it's, it's always so important that staff actually know how to don and doff their PPE and that they're competent in doffing PPE. Um, that can certainly help to prevent um, infections uh, to them and also to their patients. So make sure you have some sort of training um, schedule. And uh, also understanding the five moments for hand hygiene. A lot of people will know what the five moments for hand hygiene are, but they don't actually understand how that relates to their workflow. So it can be good to just to do some scenarios with staff to say, okay, we're entering the room, let's clean our hands, or, or when we leave the room, you know, at all, regardless of if you're wearing gloves or at any time when you go um, talk to a resident or, or when you're seeing a patient. Um, this safe use of personal protective equipment um, poster is also available on the SA Health website and it is fantastic. It's a pictorial on how to put on your PPE and then how to take it off. So um, and it's a really, even if staff are trained, sometimes if you're not doing it all the time, it is hard to remember. So it can be a really good reminder um, for staff and help them to get the, the sequencing correct. Um, did I miss something? Oh, also, um, you know, with, if you're experiencing an influenza outbreak in your facility, certainly using a disinfectant, a bleach product um, will help uh, can ensure environmental controls are in place, that the environment is not a, a constant source of um, a reservoir for transmission of an influenza illness. If in the unfortunate event you do get an outbreak, um, I guess leading on to what Anne, from what Anne was saying, surveillance is really um, important. Early detection and management of cases and having an action plan can be really beneficial to actually control that outbreak. You want to collect specimens for testing because it is good to know what organism you're actually um, dealing with, um, but that you wouldn't wait. You would start infection control uh, practices you know, well before getting the pathology results. Um, and also uh, infection control measures. So, you know, you would isolate patients, pop them into droplet precautions. Um, uh, uh, also isolate residents, you know, with any sort of infection, uh, sorry, influenza-like illness, if you can. Encouraging staff to clean their hands, cleaning the environment, upping, upping your cleaning to using a bleach product as well as detergent. Um, signage, so you're educating visitors coming into the facility um, and also other patients or residents. Um, and having staff huddles can be really beneficial each day because then everybody knows what's happening, what the plan is, how, we're all, how everyone's managing the outbreak together and also um, observational audits because just because we think people are doing uh, what they should, that's not necessarily always the case. So as a manager, you know, it's really good to be out there on the floor seeing what's happening, happening and providing support to uh, staff as well. If staff run well, excluding them from work as soon as you can um, uh, and making them feel empowered that they can stay home if they're not, if they're not well. And um, of course, immunisation for residents, patients, staff. Um, Anne talked about the use of an antiviral medication, um, which can be uh, useful. And then, you know, declaring the outbreak over, which um, in the guideline that was Anne was talking about, that I'm going to talk a bit more about in a minute. Um, no new cases for eight days from the onset of symptoms in the last case is when you would declare that outbreak over in a residential care facility or a hospital. Um, and that, that's an example of one of the signs in that document as well. Um, so where can you get help? So the resources include the SA Health Influenza page um, and basically if you start there, that'll take you to all these other documents. Um, so I just want to point out, uh, so there's your landing page for SA Health, 
www.sa.gov.au um, forward slash flu. That will link you off to this document that Anne was talking about. Now, it's a public health management document. Um, I've got it here. And it's about 74 pages long. <laughs> So this is something you would read before winter season. You would, you know, you know, have a good look at this as part of your contingency planning. But in the event um, you've just been labelled as the infection control uh, lead the day before, <laughs> which often happens with infection control professionals, there's a, a fantastic two-page flow chart that basically takes all the good bits from that document and puts it into a succinct, this is what you need to do. And that's that one there. So that's also on our flu page and it's very, very useful. Um, this document here is a bed management toolkit. So you can prioritise um, uh, which patients need single rooms, dedicated en suites, and it helps you prioritise by organism um, and is, is very useful. Um, you've also got, you've got what pages? Um, this, this is a book. We don't actually print these anymore, but all the pages um, are available from the SA Health website. And what it is, it's, it's, it lists a lot of different organisms, but it tells you um, what the organism is, it gives you in, um, incubation times, infectious um, uh, times, it um, tells you, gives you treatment options if they're available or recommendations for infection control, what's required. And it's a really good one-stop shop for a lot of organisms. Um, there's also the staying healthy guidelines that um, uh, Preventing infectious diseases in early childhood education and care services. So lots and lots and lots of resources. So local resources, don't forget to go to your local infection control leads as well and look at your local policies for infection prevention. That's really important. And we've got really fantastic resources on wash wipe cover, don't infect another. You can actually go onto the wash wipe cover website and order some of these posters and they are free of charge. So if you are interested in, in getting some of those resources, please log on. Michelle would be only too happy to help you. And there's also um, some resources that are going to be up the back that you can actually take home today. We've got some posters, so go and have a look. But they are uh, fantastic. Fact sheets, um, you know, really helpful for staff staff and um, patients and their visitors. Um, Takeaway messages are to check the SA Health and Australian Government websites regularly for updates. Um, test, treat and isolate, the best way to stop an outbreak and, and, if, and stop the spread of infection. And I guess the principles for infection prevention control are the same for most respiratory viruses. Um, you know, you incorporate your standard contact and droplet precautions. Um, but considering that aerosol generating procedures might need a higher level of um, precautions, such as airborne precautions. And wash wipe cover, don't infect another. So that's the logo. Wash your hands often, wipe down surfaces and cover your coughs and sneezes. And that's it, thank you. Any questions? Uh, Lisa, you talked about cleaning with detergent and bleach. Mm. So is that bleach? White King, how do you di dilute it? No, does the bleach have to be a certain? Yeah, so we, we use, generally recommend a sodium hypochlorite at 1,000 parts per million. So um, I think the best thing is to look at your bleach, bleach products and um, refer to the manufacturer's guidelines on what they are, have claims against. So if, if influenza is the organism that you're looking at, controlling, look at that product, but generally bleach 
um, is a suitable product um, to follow up after cleaning. So you can't use it alone, you still need to actually clean the surface first. Yep. Thanks. Um, you didn't mention the College, uh, RS, Royal Australian College of General Practice Guidelines. And the RACGP makes the comments that um, basically we have uniform issues around uh, infectious control, but the translation of hospital policies and procedures to general practice and other office and community-based practices is not always appropriate due to differing risk and equipment and staff factors. Have you got any comments about the differences between what the college is talking about and um, SA Health uh, recommendations? I think that's part of a risk assessment that you, you take all the information and you work that out from a risk approach in your facility or GP practice or where you, you are working. Um, of course, infection prevention is not a one, one, uh, you know, one solution fits all. So you would work it out in relation to um, the PPE that you have available, um, your staff, um, skill set, um, patients presenting to your clinic, um, I guess what type of procedures you're pro providing um, and have that as part of your local policy of, in your area. Does that answer your question, sort of? Mm -hmm. Thank you.